Hi everyone, my name is Sean Lindersmith, also known as Snacks. I'm the head coach of the University of Minnesota men's program. Um, I'm here to talk today about building a defensive strategy, which we'll get the presentation up in a minute, which will be my talking points. Um, essentially, I built this presentation assuming nothing, right? I don't know where you come from. I don't know what clubs you're at, whether you coach men, women, boys, girls, middle school, high school, university, senior club, or the, the Eagles, or MLR. No idea. So I thought I would put together a basic presentation and build from the 10,000 foot level framework of a defensive strategy all the way down to the micro skills of the breakdown decision making at the tackle contest. And my Lord and Savior, Ryan O'Day, I have saved my butt again. Um, this is Ryan, she's our social media marketing manager at the University of Minnesota Men's Program. Does awesome work as you can see. Thank you, Ryan. I do have the clicker. Uh, okay, where was I? Assuming nothing, right? Um, that is just to, to say like, we're gonna talk about defense. We're gonna talk about building a strategy. We're gonna try to put it in as basic terms as possible so that way you as a coach or you as a player can take back some information or maybe learn something new or maybe even provide some input to me that I may have never heard of. So speaking of that, I really need feedback. As a coach, I need a head nod, I need eye contact, or I need, coach, I don't understand. Or coach, that's a great point. Or coach, I kind of don't get it. Could you maybe put that in simpler terms? Okay, so all of that, not, uh, not off the table. Speak up, raise a hand. I'll try to call up as many people as possible. Um, I want this to be less of a I talk at you presentation and more of we engage in a discussion. All right, this side of the room learns from this side of the room, so on and so forth. Um, speaking of that, we'll start. What do we want to accomplish in this session? What is coaches and players, administrators, referees, what are you looking for? What do you, when, when you sat and said, I want to sit in a defensive strategy session, what sort of things came to your mind? Will this help my understanding of what I have to do? What you have to do? Okay. Anything specific around that? Maybe micro skills, macro? Positioning as far as like if um, scenarios in which I engage someone versus which I don't. Okay. Um, how to scramble from offense to defense if we lose the ball. If okay. I'm not in the ideal spot, what do I have to do in that spot that's not my particular forte? Okay. We hadn't talked about the transition between offense and defense before, but we can talk about that certainly. Okay. Um, anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, kind of helping players in their decision making. Ah, so yeah. kind of knowing situational awareness of when should I be pressing forward, when should I be, you know, covering over here, or, you know, just that decision making aspect of defense. Okay. Okay. Got gotcha. you. Decision making. You have something? Kind of going off of that being dynamic, uh, offense is another decision making. Can you say that last part again? Being able to match up with offense, um, being dynamic, and your defense because your offense is the same with that. So be able to adjust to an ever-changing attack environment. Does that sound good? Okay. Let me know if I cover these sorts of things. If I don't, we will cover it. If it's not in this room, come see me at the Minnesota table. Come catch me. I will talk your ear off about defense and rugby in particular. So no stone on turf if, if you have a stone. So with that, let's get started. What is, those, how many of you have played rugby before? Okay. How many of you are coaches? Okay. I want you to think back about maybe the best teams you've played on or teams you've seen. What does great defense look like, sound like, feel like? What's it felt like when you played it or maybe coached it? What's it look like? And I'm using this picture as an example. For us, this is a pretty great defensive moment. We'll talk a little bit about that, but I'd like to hear your input. Yes? It's a unified front, so you don't get one person kind of going alone. You're still moving together to kind of take that uh, field attack. Right, advance, right? Advance on the attack. Yes? Vocal. Vocal. Give me a little bit more about that. Vocal as in? Like, the defense can always be communicated to like come together, like stuff like that. Like, yeah. Communicating how the offense yeah, almost chaotic, huh? right? Like, I got her, I got them, this is my person, I'm coming up, 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 right? That, that sort of chaos of war, the fog of war type stuff. 
Okay. What else? Can I ask a question about the pitcher? If you're looking at this and you're me as a coach, what indicators up there are telling you we're playing great defense? Numbers on numbers? Numbers on bodies? What else? We talked about advancing. How do you know we're advancing? Yep. Not flat footed. Not flat footed, right? Specifically, we're looking here at our winger jack and our outside center Josh. You can see they're in movement and the ball has just left the hands of the halfback. So we're moving, we're advancing. Okay? What else? We have fringe protection around the ruck. Fringe protection around the ruck, right here, Luke. Okay, we also have, I believe that's J. Robert Alex, maybe that's two people in one, but we, we have good protection, right? We'll talk about what those assignments are, um, how we do it, and maybe how we all, other people can do it as well. Okay. Anything else about what great defense looks, feels, sounds like? You guys are gonna wait, you're lined up, you're ready to come together. Yeah, connected. We like to call that connected. Despite there being an overload defensively, there's also not an overload offensively on the other side of the ball. You're not committing too many people in the rock. You have enough defenders. Yeah, numbers of defenders. That's a great, great observation. Okay, and that comes into play a little bit. We'll talk about that. All right. So for us, University of Minnesota, we've been an attack-based team for a long time. We can attack all day, every day from anywhere on the park, on the on the pitch, excuse me, on the park or whatever. So we need to create a defensive culture. Okay, culture is a buzzword in rugby right now, in all kinds of sports, the corporate world. Essentially, culture is just how you do things as a team, what standards you keep, what behaviors you accept, what goals you all set together as, as a team. Agree? That's pretty simple. Yeah. Okay. So for us, it started with terminology. Uh, and we put, created a structure. Okay. When you think about defense, what kind of descriptive words would you use to describe a great defense? Mine's cohesive. Cohesive, fast, line speed. How about, uh, how about smothering, collapsing, <clears throat> suffocating, choking, right? I know those are pretty terrible words in the other places in the world, but in defense, right, defense, we want to take away time and space of the attack. We've got to choke them out. We've got to cut them off. We've got to get in their face and we've got to be aggressive, whether we're in a blitz or a drift or a hybrid, right? Um, what sort of terms? Does anybody else have terms that they're using currently in defense? Pressure. Pressure? How do you use pressure? Uh, so Coming up on one phase is one thing, but then to continue moving forward when the offense and all the cat is kind of on their back foot, yeah. continue to apply that pressure to force a mistake, the turnover, bad pass. Great. I think that's awesome. Okay. For, for us at the University of Minnesota, we wanted to put a term around that specific concept of pressure. Okay? And, and, and what is a good defense, right? Good defense puts pressure, resets, puts pressure, right? That may be considered relentless. In nature, what does that look like? Waves. Looks like waves arriving at a beach, crashing. Boom! Boom! Constantly, relentlessly pounding the shoreline. Right? So we took that concept of waves crashing on the shoreline, and typically a lot of people steal stuff from New Zealand or England, right? Everybody sees the all-blacks and they use words. Okay, the Kiwis use a word called tainui, which is pie. Right? The word tie. And so they'll call it the Black Tainui, or the Chiefs have a word for it as well. We connected that. It's an opportunity for coaches to connect with your local area. So, <clears throat> I'm nervous, sorry. Uh, the local Ojibwe nation has a word called Bagamashka. And it's the thing I yell the most. <laughs> but uh, it means the waves arrive. The waves arrive. And we scream it. And we, it's our physical, our verbal cue to get up and get off the line. And you can hear me, if you ever watch a video, I said this last night, but if you ever watch a video and you're hearing this crazy dude on the sideline with a hoodie and a hat screaming, Bagamashka! Bagamashka! That is us saying, get up, get on your feet, get in the fight. Get numbers on numbers and go. Um, numbers on numbers, numbers on feet brings me to set simple goals. Okay. What type of goals could you set as a defense to show that you're playing good or bad or 
whatever he does. What could you set? Turnovers, big boys. How many turnovers you get? Yeah. What else? Anybody else? What's the one thing we think about on defense that is in the micro skill game that we talk about a lot? They missed what? Make or miss a tackle. Okay. Now, as a coach, I thought about that too. Like maybe missing tackles would be a great goal for us, not to miss or a percentage or whatever, right? But then a, a coach I respect said, "Hey, snacks, you realize you can make every tackle in the game and still lose." And I went, "Okay, go on." And they said, and "If you think about it, you could miss seventy-five percent of your tackles and still win the game." You might miss two or three, but you get them, you get a turnover and go, right? And that could happen over and over again. So the nice new tactic completion isn't a thing. For us, or for your coaches, what what do a player what does a player need to do in order to play defense? Make a decision at the breakdown or advance on an opponent? What, what do they have to be? Confident. Yes, yeah. Confident and disruptive. And on your feet. On your feet. You have to be on your feet. Okay, so earlier we alluded that we had more defenders than the attackers. Our goal is numbers on feet. If we can have 11 to 13 players and every single defensive set on their, on their feet, we're gonna be in a really good position to, to create a turnover or to play good defense. Yeah, okay, that's a really simple goal. That's something everybody could attest to. And everybody can get that concept. Oh, I can't play defense if I'm on the ground. Sweet, I gotta get up. And I gotta get up fast. Um, as coaches, it's imperative to talk about your terminology. It's imperative to talk about your goals, not just with your coaches, but with your players. With your players. Get everybody on the same page. Talk about what your, your calls mean. They're your calls, and if everybody knows what that framework or the structure of that terminology is, you're fine, you're good. And then you can measure that success, whether they're doing the action or not, based on your calls or whatever you want to do, based on your goals. Okay? How would you make these stick, though, as coaches? How would a coach make those stick? Repetition. Repetition? What's another word for doing repetition? Practice. Practice it. Put it into play in everything you do. Okay? Outside of technique, right? Isolated skill work, everything should have an attack component and a defense component to reinforce your principles of both. Even a one on one, there's a tracking component, an attack component, and an evasive running component on the attack side. See how that works? And you can get that in almost everything you do, with the exception of like maybe just passing the ball back and forth. Yeah, or line out for those simple things. So now we've sort of talked about like how we talk about it, what we'll talk about, or like uh, defining things, you know, principles of defense. Now we'll talk about the framework or the structure, the bones of your defense. Okay, we're 12 3 or 12 plus threes, 13 twos, and 14 ones. Okay, in the world of rugby. The first number is indicate, 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 indicates how many players are in that line, and the second number is the players in the backfield. Okay, this also applies. So this sort of like those up there also apply to the lineup. You may hear six plus one, five plus one, right? That's the same exact concept. Six in the lineup, one person out in the scrum half the position, or that tail gun, or however you do that. Okay. We'll talk about a little bit about when do you run each of these and sort of the shape. Okay, the shape of your defense, does that matter? You want to talk about shape, like where would you put your tight five forwards on the field in defense? Optimally. Hmm? Middle. Why? Because not fast. Ooh. Bro. <laughs> look fast to you, bro. <laughs> your bigger players, you want them to conserve some energy. The middle of the field is not necessarily a place where they're going to get pushed to the edge, back to the edge. They're going to stay in that middle of the field. Why is it also good to have your type 5 forwards in the middle of the field? Offensive part likely has their type 5 in the center of the field. Good matchups there. 
And we also kind of transition back to our transitional play. If we get a turnover, we go into our system of a 1331 or a 1322 or a 242, bang, you're right into it. They aren't running all the way across the field to get into a, a, an arrow shape or your punch shape or whatever you got. They're right there. Turnover ball, hey, give me a forward. Boom, we got a punch. Give me another punch. And then all of a sudden you're right into that trans transitional play. Okay? 25% of tries in Super Rugby are scored off that transitional play after a turnover. It's a pretty high number, right? So if you work on that, that'll be good. Um, who do you want outside your type five? Type fives in the middle. Get towards that 15 meter mark on the field. Who would we put there? Centers and loose forwards. Centers and loose forwards. Why? They're a little bit of a combination between the type five forwards and some of the, the wider backs that can move around a little bit more. We like to call them the jacklers. Yeah. They're the players that will probably get you a turnover the quickest. All right, and and had pretty good decision makers. The edge of the field is also a great place to attack because most attacks are thin on the edge. They're really crowded in the middle of the field. So if you get a one-on-one -on -one opportunity with like a hooker, a flanker, or a inside or outside center, man, that's a great attacking opportunity to turn it over. Yeah. Then outside of them, outside backs. Maybe you're 10, maybe you're nine, depending on what you want to do. We'll talk about that here in a second. Okay, so the first framework is a 13-2. We have 13, 13 players up on the line. We have two players in the backfield. Typically, who would we put in these backfield positions? What players? 10 and 15. Why would you do that? Uh, they probably have the best boot to kick it back if we want to do that, or they can take the high ball a little bit better than the long player. Take the high ball, they can kick. What else do 10 and 15 players likely more better communicators or be communicators? The organizers, maybe, right? They're the guys that decide to kick or run or get it into touch because holy shit, we're on our, on our goal line, right? We also, we want to keep 10, maybe 15 out of contact because they do have to do that organizing. You don't want your 10 making 10 tackles and then trying to go run your offense at the 78th minute when you're trying to get five points on the board. You want them as fresh as possible, clear, clear headed as possible, and ready to go. So I would suggest 10 and 15 in the backfield. Okay? 13 to, I think that's about all I have on that. Why, has anybody noticed this defense being played anywhere? It's probably one of the more standard defenses in international professional rugby and it's matriculating its way down into the university, MLR, and hopefully into the high school games pretty soon as well. Reason being, what technical skill in the United States do we, we're not great at right now? Kicking. Kicking. Tactical kicking. It's really tough for a lot of our kickers to put the ball in the corners. We grip it, we rip it, and it goes wherever it goes. It doesn't go where we want it half the time. Agree, disagree? Okay. 12-3. What type of an attack would, would this work best against? Potentially. Cover the back of the room, a footwork back of the room. Okay, I got that. What type of attack would you run this against? Kicking team. Just in the off chance somebody's got a great kicker, you now have three people in the backfield to field those kicks. Okay? You could play this two ways. You could designate specific players in the backfield, one wing, fullback or 10 fullback, or you can play a pendulum system where the winger on each side drops back depending on where the ball goes. So if the ball goes away to the right, if we're attacking this way, the left-hand wing would drop back, right? And then the 10 and the 15 would shift over. If the ball comes back to the left, that winger enters the line to remain the 12 bodies up in the line, and that backside winger drops back. That's called a pendulum or a banana defense. Yeah, anybody else heard it called anything else? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Now 14-1. When would we run 14 players in the line with one back? What part of the field? Inside 22. Inside the 22. Okay. We want maximum coverage across the park, owning the width of the field to, to try to cover as much space that's left out there. 
agree? Anybody, anybody run this? Yeah, we kind of all do, right? We get into 22. And the closer we get, typically don't we see the person in the backfield get closer and closer to the line and join in. Sometimes they'll be up almost to a 15, 15 up in the line. Yeah. Okay. One of the questions that we haven't covered yet is the role of the scrum half. Okay. Scrum halves are typically what kind of player? Scrappy, what other words? The best. The best, right? <laughs> Some of the best minds, great decision makers, right? We talked about the decisions we have to make at the tackle. We talked about that in a couple times places. So you put, you can put your nine in this front line, okay? And they are part of the, the 12 or part of the 13 or the 14, but you can give them free license to fill gaps where they need be, or if they see an opportunity to just go for it. Just go for it. If, if we're looking back at that picture that we showed about the great defense, the reason that set was, was great is that we put enough pressure on that flanker who was in first receiver, and then R9 came immediately over the ball, earned a turnover, tapped, carried down, one rock, pass, try time. The transitional play. And it all came from R9 being that mobile, adaptable player into the line. Now, as coaches, you give them the license or the permission you see fit. You can tell them, hey, just fill gaps, or you go, be a wild, wild player out there, get a turnover if you can, be solid over the ball. Okay, we've got our framework. Now we go into what I call the three A's, the first of which is the alignment. Okay, what type of defense are we playing? What kind of defenses are out there? We've talked a little bit about the pressure or drift, right? Drift, slide, pressure, blitz, rush, okay? Uh, and sometimes teams, we didn't talk about it last night, but I'll cover it today, so I'm much better with my time and I'm not messing up the slides. But what defense we play affects our launch, okay? Launch meaning what? What is a launch? Getting off the line. Getting off the line, launching your defensive attack. Okay? Launching your team into the other's backfield and, and, and creating havoc, right? Wreaking just chaos, which is what I like to do, okay? So we've got two types of defense. We'll talk about drift first, okay? Talk about inside out alignment. What does that mean? Physically, I'm aligned on their what? Inside shoulder, inside shoulder, right? And in, in a drift defense, we're coming up and out, that slide. Right, we move with the ball. Okay, we use drift defense typically in which framework? Thirteen-two or twelve-three? If you're looking to use a sideline as a sixteen player, which one would you use? Twelve-three typically, right? Come slide up, push into the corner, use the touch line as a defender. Get them into that edge. You look for an opportunity. However, most of the times the drift defense is looking to stop tries, right? Stop a hemorrhage of, of tries, stopping the team, the other team from scoring. It's why they call it a low risk, low reward defense. Is because it's not as pressurized as a drift or as a blitz or a rush defense. Okay, you, you'll get opportunities, but you probably won't get as much in a drift defense as opposed to a rush. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, it's a matter of mindset too, right? We know a drift is used to just cut people off, stop them from scoring, hopefully they make an error, unforced error, we, we play out from there, right? This defense, the drift defense, is susceptible to inside running lines, right? An inside running line is a, back, a ball back inside because we're pushing up and out, right? So if that inside defender is not connected and not dri uh, drifting with you, there's a hole there. Like great ball, right? Off 10, big forwards are in the line, fake, boom, back inside and they go through. My like dream ball, love it. Just put a couple tries off that. Oh, uh, susceptible to inside running lines. Now, excuse me, but I'm gonna get pretty excited here because we're gonna talk about a rush defense. That's what we've switched to. And I'm, make no mistake, I'm actually pitching this to all of you that this might be something you want to consider, okay? 
Rush defense is an outside in alignment, and we're coming outside. What advantages does that give us? Keeps the ball from getting to the outside. Say that again, Tyler. Keeps the ball from getting to the outside. Keeps the ball, right? We shut down that outside channel. Okay. What else? Most likely you have your forwards on your inside, so you're forcing their ball carrier kind of back towards where your big bodies are. Potentially, right? Forcing it back into support, right? Okay. When you get the ball, what do you naturally do? Drift outside. You start naturally drifting because you, your, your mind is telling you the space is out there, the green grass is out there. So as a defender, if I'm lined up on your outside shoulder, I, instead of me taking five steps and, and drifting with you, I'm going, ha, 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 one, two, bang. Cut that, now, if you think about that in terms of data and, and analytics, if you're taking four less steps in every single defensive set, how much more energy do you have at the end of the game? A shit ton, yeah? Agree, disagree? Right? Cuts down that energy. You do need to be fitter to play a rush defense, but you'll play at a higher level longer because you're not working as hard. They're coming to you, okay? It is a very high risk, high reward because in essence, you're looking to get the ball back. You're getting them isolated, right? You don't have to drift with them and take that time to get up to their space. They're coming to you, you're getting them to the ground and you're looking for an opportunity, either a penalty and a turnover, right? Or you just win the ball outright or win a counter rough opportunity. And that all comes down to mindset too, right? If you're talking about a rush defense, you're saying, everyone, we're coming at this, guns blazing. We're cutting them off, we're chopping them down at the trees, at the knees, excuse me. We're putting them on the ground, we're looking for opportunities. We're getting the ball back and then we're attacking, we're running it right down their throat. Which, when it works, you practice it enough, holy shit, it's awesome. And as a coach, sometimes there are days I was like, well, shit, that worked. I can't believe it. That is awesome. Okay? One of the things that this is susceptible to is the late running line to the decoy out the back. Right? So you got a player here, and you're looking for a decoy runner outside. You usually they call it punch and roll or uh, any other terms where the player cuts in and there's one out the back. I call it punch and roll. Punch and Judy, I've heard. Anybody else? I need a new name for this. I'm trying to come up with it. <laughs> Blocker. Blocker line, that's the other one too, right? Blocker line, roll out. Okay. Now, we talk about alignment. We're either in a drift or we're in a blitz. And we're gonna look at an assignment. Who's marking who? What are, how are we gonna identify that? What's the designator we're gonna work there? Are we gonna go, what else do we have? What else do we have? Uh, what happens at the tackle contest is also in there, right? The decision-making process we talked about, okay? Um, what decisions do we have at the tackle contest? You've made the tackle, you're on your feet, clear rights to the ball. What three things do you have? Poach. Poach. What else? Seal. Down a rock. Seal would also be in a poach, right? Because you hold it up. They say, somebody say seal. And if, if you can't poach, if you can't counter rock, what's the third option? Get out. Get out, reconnect. Okay? So, my recommendation, who's heard of post guard, dog guard, pillar, post, all those words, right? My recommendation is cut that down. One, two, three, A, B, C. Okay? Make it simple. I got one right, one left. You know. Where would you fill? Would you fill inside out or outside in? Uh, uh, from the rock. What would you do? Inside out. Inside out, so one, two, three, four. Kind of subversive, right? One, two, three, four. Okay. Typically, outside of four, we get into that first receiver, the 10 area, the 12 area, and we're kind of body on body from there. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we talk about is when we're talking alignment, we say put your sternum on that shoulder, whether it's inside or outside. Why would I put my sternum on and get you thinking sternum? Square. Okay? Check this out. I'm lining up on his inside shoulder. I'm still lined up. 
But if I put my sternum on it, I'm square. I'm ready to front up and get into his face. No turning or whatever. So, lead me to another point. When you're in the defensive line, rookies on this side of me, which foot would you recommend putting up? Inside foot or outside foot? Inside foot. Why inside? Keeps you square. Keeps you square. Essentially, right? Outside foot up, the head naturally gravitates. The head will turn, the body goes with it. The ball's over there, we just naturally start doing this number, and all of a sudden we have a cutback lane here. Right, we have a gap. And we want to cut that down. Outside foot, and it's, it's, it's not this, it's that. You need a toe ahead of it and your body will stay square. Okay? How do you reinforce that? Practice. What kind of practice? In practice, what kind of what kind of cues would you give your team? Eyes up, eyes up, up, inside foot up, inside foot up, sternum on, sternum on, sternum on. My person, my person. I have them. I have them, you have them. Inside foot, remember, inside foot. Ready, 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 launch. Ooh, who calls the launch? I go inside out for the launch, so whoever's closest to the ball, so the rest of my team's not, keep not looking towards that person now, I got to face. You're calling one? Yeah. One calls the ball out, yeah, Tyler? Uh, maybe three. Maybe three, okay. Do I have any votes for two? Two. Two, okay. All of those are perfectly acceptable if that's what you do. Perfectly acceptable. One thing I would, I would impart, Tyler, I'm sorry I'm telling you this, but number one, our job is this gap right here, right? The inside shoulder of this first ball carrier here to the nine. And their whole role is to stop the nine from taxiing. And once they pass it, it's to be a dickhead to that guy. Push him, nudge him, pitch him, harass him. Try to get them out of their game. But we're not talking like cheap, but you know that old like, oh, oops, sorry. You get that 50 times in a game, some nines and their personalities, they may not like that. You might get them out of their game, just that 1% enough to be like, they're not making the right decision next time, or he looks up and goes, I'm just gonna run over this guy. And they run the ball and you go one-on-one, -on -one, isolated. See ya, we get the penalty. So we run, what we like to do is two or three call it. They have a much wider vision, right? Their outside foot is up. They can still see that there see it in their peripheral view, and that's really bright, I'm sorry. I turned my head and it was terrible. But they can call that, and what that does is it allows one to focus on the nine chat, that little A gap channel, because the nines are sneaky, they're fast, they're quick and agile, right? And if you get a forward, a prop on a nine, uh, that could be a battle that nine wins. Maybe seven out of 10 times. Agree, disagree? Yeah, Brian, what do you think? Yep. What? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. All right, so we go back to terminology. For us, or I'm going to keep saying us, some of the things we've done, what we've done is we've used terms that are from video games or from things that players at, <coughs> at our level, which is college age men, they would relate with. How many college age men play the game Call of Duty? Oh shit, right? They understand double tap, and they understand one bullet, one kill. It's military sort of speed, kind of law enforcement, and it don't mean that law enforcement killed anybody. I said I wasn't gonna say murder today, but I am. Um, essentially, we're looking at a double tackle or a single tackle. Okay, double tap, put two people on. Put them down, bang, bang, and the ground, you bury them, you still fall. Single, chop tackle, get low, get an opportunity. If you're doing a chop tackle, what's the target area for you, your shoulder? Chop tackle? Right above the knee. Right above the knee? Why do we go chop tackle right above the knee? Takes all the leverage away. Takes the leverage away, they can't run anymore, we can get them to the ground pretty quickly, yeah? Okay, if we're going double tackle, what are we targeting? You got two players on one player. What's an opportunity there? Yeah, high, low, high low, choke them, steal the ball, hold it up, right? We target the ball. 
target. It's a choke tackle is the terminology. Again, I didn't make this, I'm just saying it. Uh, one of the things for the, the training that we give our players is we use, how many people use hit shields? Not tackle shields? Okay, that's quite a large surface area, right? And that, that aiming point we're looking for, either on a choke tackle or a chop tackle, is like between here and here, right? Or maybe here and here, the ball's about here. What we did is we found Amazon Basics six pound bed balls. Okay, they're light and they're squishy enough. They're like a, a rigider version of a hit shield carried right here at that angle. And we know if we hit that either square on or just below that, that we're probably gonna get really good results in the game and not get up in the high tackle matrix area. Okay. They're a very cheap training aid. I think it's about half the cost of a hit shield. And you can do so much stuff with them, whether it's racing or core exercises or wrestling around with it. We put them on the ground and use them as like sprawl to jackal type stuff, like just working a lot of ground game. And I couldn't say enough about it. Um, one of the terms that we use in the double tackle, right? We've heard this, who's heard? You go high, I go low. Right, two players come in. What is that talking about? Who's tackling high, who's tackling low? Yeah, who's, who's going first, right? First player, typically what do we want them to do? Grab legs. Grab legs, go low. Second player, come in, tack the ball. Try to, try to hold that up maybe, yeah? If you're in the fringes, the ruck is here, we go, one, two defender, right? Which defender here do we want to go first low? One defender. The one defender is what? Who gets there faster? Gets there faster. This player also has to take away the offload lane or the tips option, right? They run that forward punch, tips outside option. They're banking on this defender coming in and that third ball carrier comes right in that lane, okay? So you take away the offload and then you attack the ball. Am I saying, am I, am I on point there? Yeah, on point? Am I, are you guys tracking? Yeah. Get a little bit ahead now. I was told to work the back of her, so I'm coming back there. Okay. Hopefully this works. It's not working. Okay. We have our alignment, we have our assignments, and we talk about our adjustments. Okay. Again, what are the three choices on attack and contest? Three decisions. Anyone? Get out. Oh, rock, counter rock, great option. Post, steal, jackal, third one. Get out. Is get out a negative term? Do you consider a negative term? Yeah? Get out of there. No, come on. I'm going to connect with you. Let's connect back to the defensive line. Also, maybe a good option. Counter, jackal, connect. Or however you want to decide that. I actually listened to a podcast that said the word defense is a negative term. You're always on defense. You're always trying to get back on attack. Some coaches are now naming their defensive stuff after other things, which is an interesting concept. I'm still marinating on that. So if anybody gets any ideas or anything around that, I would love to hear that. Okay? So what happens if we poach the ball? If we get a clean steal, what can we do? Okay. Run with it, okay? Or we can offload it to a player who's probably not got somebody hanging on to a leg, right? Okay. Um, last night there was a, I heard great option, two passes, two away, right? Get it away from that point of contact. Everybody's in this melee, get it into the space. Why is, when you turn the ball over in a poach situation, getting it away from that point of great option? Defense isn't set. They're still all sitting in their back line and their punch setups and going, wait, I thought we had the ball. Get it away from that point of contact, move it, and start looking for an attack opportunity. Can you do the same thing with the counter run? Counter run goes over, somebody picks it all up, we can move the ball away. The key that I'm trying to get here is have a plan and talk about that plan in training. Right? You can work a tackle contest. Players get to that point where they got the ball and they're looking up and just going, Coach, I got it. I got it. And you go, now what? And 
if you talk about it, they'll go, coach, I got it. Who's, and they'll start looking for it, right? And in those activities, you can put a receiver and let them hit that receiver. So that muscle memory just starts getting ingrained in them, okay? If we don't win the contest, actually, I'll, I'll digress. If we're gonna get out of the rut, right? We're gonna leave that rut area, it's not an opportunity. How do we wanna get back on our feet? Some of you are thinking it's a trick question. You made eye contact. How would you get out of it? As fast as possible, roll as away. As fast as possible, roll away, somersault, jumping jack, get your ass up off the ground. Yeah? It spin out, whatever you gotta do. A good attacking team is probably gonna do what to a tackler? Hold them. Hold them in. Okay? Practice that training too. What are you going to do if somebody's holding your leg or holding your ear? If you slap at it, it's called retaliation. It's usually the talk. No one ever sees the first punch. Well, the punch is the holding back, right? The referee's only going to see you going like this. And they're going to be like, you're gone. So we sit out. Pull, pull away from it. We grab their little fingers and just pull one. Okay. We break the elbow, break the plane of the elbow, right? And push into it. Um, alluding back to my, my friend's point over here, get your butt out of the tackle contest. If you have no opportunity, get outside, get on the line, get ready to launch. Get back in the fight. Any way, shape, or possible. I would encourage you to ask your player to create a way to get out of the room. We're here, we're pinned on the ground, what will we do? to see if they come up with okay? Rugby is a game, we'll talk about that. Uh, uh, uh. I need to finish the points, so we'll get to that in the micro skills. If we don't win the contest, then what? If we don't win the contest, we're out, we're connecting. We have two options then, right? Because a tackler and an assist has gone into the rock. What do we do? What can we do? The answer is up. Boulder hold, right? Has anybody heard those terms before? Anybody heard boulder hold? No one to fold them? No one to hold them? Richard, what does hold what does fold mean? Oh shit, go on. <laughs> yeah. That's true. No, uh, where are you at? We're on folder hold. What does fold mean? Hold, uh, be able to get back in line. Get back in the line. Folding, if there's a rough contest here. Tacklers come in, all of a sudden there's two spaces left, right? If there's a tackler and assist in the tackle area, we have to fold around the rock to replace those numbers. <coughs> fold is the replacement of bodies in the rock. And that's determined by the numbers that you're looking at in front of you. And so if they get numbers, right? Typically we try to play with continuity, right? Play with the flow of the game. Would everybody agree, disagree? Yeah, sometimes you're in this direction, but most times we're going with the flow of play. So if you make a tackle here, all of a sudden that gap's open, we've got to fold around the rough, get bodies on bodies, numbers on feet, and launch again. Yeah? What if they don't? What if, you, what if you're on this side of the rock and all of a sudden you start seeing bodies matriculating to this side? What do you do? Hold. Oh. Got hold. You can hold. And that's a perfectly acceptable thing too, right? You see the numbers? Coach, they, they didn't move, so I just took the body. That was my responsibility. What do we got next? Ah, why do we fold? We fold around the number to rock to match numbers. Um, who has been in the school of thought that you never move the post? You never move the person next to the rock, right? I was also a big believer in that until I started consuming defensive content during COVID, and I think we're wrong. And I think I've had my opinion changed. And I'd like to pitch to you that you could also change that opinion too. So if you're having to replace these numbers here, right, this player if normally would slot down, and maybe there's a gap over here. Would everybody agree it's possible? Okay. Then, if everybody collapses down, what happens to the space on the outside? Why don't they? Starts creating space. 
every player you move towards the ruck, you move space opening on the outside. Is the outside the best place to attack? I believe. A couple passes, around you go. So in order to protect the space on the outside, some of the recommendations now, and then what we're playing is, we take this third or fourth defender, depending on how many people go in the tackle area, and we move them out. And then the folders, the first player goes wide, second player goes tight, third and so on and so forth, if you do that, and they come around and they just launch. They're trying to time it, and then the ball's coming out, they're moving forward already, and they continue on and just create that attack and try to get these players behind the game line. Yeah, they're already moving, so it's pretty easy for them to continue moving. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. Is it cool? That, all right, I'm misquoting that. Okay, so I'm asking you to maybe reconsider that, think about it, try the training, and see what happens. And then let me know what you think. Okay, you can always find me on the Go for Rugby page. If you, if anybody does this and it's working really well, or doesn't work, I'd love to know. I would love to know. Okay, now, we've gone 10,000 foot level, right? Structure, come down about the five foot, 5,000 foot level, we know what type of defense we're playing, inside out, outside in, drift, blitz, rush, slide, whatever. We go adjustments, we're about 3,000 feet. Now we're at the 500 foot level. When you're the player on that line, or you're training the players on that line, I think these are the micro skills that we should focus on. The first one, tracking, this one here, I believe is 75% of the job. And BC stands for ball carrier. If you cannot get to the ball carrier and get your footwork close enough for them to put a shot on with the shoulder, you're never gonna smash it. So you've gotta play, you've gotta work that into your training somehow of getting to another person and defending them. Now, we're Americans. Most of us have had PE classes. Most of us have played recreational sports. We've been to summer camps. We've played rookie rugby maybe. We've played other types of games. We have some of the best tracking games already ingrained in our head that are fun, they connect one another, and they're easy to implement in training probably in a warm-up. We play small side of games, tag. We play old state rugby, we play um, it's called 10 pass where you connect with passes and the defenders have got to defend the player, right? They're moving, they're getting, they're, they're understanding how their bodies get to another player, another human. And this will go back, I was going to make this point earlier, but I, I really want to reiterate this point here. And this kind of goes for everything that we're working here. This rugby is a game of play. Humans are play. We adapt socially through play. We run, we jump, we wrestle, we fight. Argue, we jump, we throw, we catch, we evade one another, right? What does rugby look like? All those things. So, in your tracking or tackling or breakdown decisions, right? Put play involved. Put those aspects in it. Of, you know, let's uh, let's work on running, rolling, getting up and rolling, running again. <coughs> you know, how many times have you seen folks do that in the game? How many times have you seen a sniper, they fall down and they're like, oh my god, what do I do? Right? Well, if you're doing those in training, the muscle memory is like, I heard this, we're just running. Oh, I'm falling. Boom, I roll. Boom, I'm up again, and away we go. Yeah? Five, thank you. Okay? I think I beat the dead horse on the tracking aspect. The next one is tackling. How are we, we going to smash that? We're going to use the shoulder, we're going to use the clamp, we're going to use... You know, we're going to use footwork to get in the hoop and all those things, right? Here we go breakdown decisions. We talked about that. Poach, counter up, connect, and our ground game. I can't, can't stress this enough. How we get up and get off the ground is just as important as how we pass. If you can't get up and get on your feet, you can't go the game. Okay? Now, with five minutes left, I offer you free resources. Okay? The top two are what I consider some of the best free resources in the world of rugby. The first one, the US, oh, there's that, there's my little pointer. The USA Football Shoulder Tackling System, if you type that into Google, it'll take you right to the page. 
you register for an account as a coach, and you get you get to watch all these videos and learn the basic terminology that USA Football uses to teach the tackle situation. They also teach tracking on there as well. I mean, we're talking something like 20 or 30 years. Just in that one alone, okay? Now, USA Football Tackling shoulder, shoulder Tackling System also has an advanced one that you can purchase that goes on sale periodically for a very reduced cost. It's run by a guy named Andy Ryland, who's also down here in the Twitter, okay? Andy Ryland was a football player at Penn State, also an All-American flanker at Penn State and played for the Eagles. He has a rugby background. So what he did is he sought out the next guy, or the guy, Richie Gray, who created the second one, which is the World Rugby Tackle Ready Program, to create the shoulder tackling system. Richie Gray then created the World Rugby Tackle Ready system under the World Rugby Passport. Has anybody heard of that, the passport? It's a free registration as a member of World Rugby that you can go take free online modules on tackling, coaching, player welfare, basic medical, like what you should expect at an event. Um, there's some strength and conditioning stuff on there. There's other courses that you can take that are a little bit more advanced, but right now, the World Rugby Tackle Ready program is ridiculous. It's got so much good stuff in there. We picked four activities from every training, and we're gonna be one, two, three, four, five trainings, and we haven't done the same one twice, okay? All these ones on the the coaches to absorb, Sean Edwards, Lori Fisher, Stu Lancaster, um, if you want to take a picture of that, I'll leave it up for a second. I highly re recommend all those coaches. They basically give away free drills. They show you what they're doing in training all the time. Shit, you send me the PowerPoint. I'll put it up on the side of the stage. We got it. Yeah, we're going to do it. Thank you guys for having me. I'm really, really awesome. I feel really awesome to be here. If you've got any questions, walk away from here. Go, oh, shit, I forgot. Ask me. Some hit me up. I'm going to have you. Thank you. Thanks, coach.